Just testing, testing. There we go. You can go through to Philippians chapter 4. I'm just going to read from verses 10 to 13, and then I'll pray, and then we're going to look at this text. Starting at verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now, um, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for your goodness to us. Um, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your word in context. Um, we, we hear this promise that we can do all things through you who strengthen us. And Paul uh, stood on this, on this promise. Um, he, he was very encouraged by the fact that you are a God that can strengthen us to do incredible things. But Lord, we so often read these texts out of context, and um, that leads to many bad things as well. So Lord, we pray that you may open our eyes to see what Paul really meant here. We pray, Lord, that if we have any wrong understanding, that you would correct it. And we pray, Lord, that we may learn that contentment that Paul spoke of in this text. Amen. Soon Colin and I'll be starting a series on judges, which we both very excited about. I think we bought a lot of commentaries for it. And... Um, in the meantime, just as we, we prepare, because you want to start the series nicely, um, we're going to just do once-off messages. That doesn't mean that these once-off messages need to be void of a theme. So whenever I preach, at least, between series, Colin's welcome to join me with this if he, he wants to as well. Or when we break from a series that we, we are doing, I'll do book overviews like I did a few weeks back and discuss passages of Scripture that are commonly twisted or misunderstood. Today we're going to look at a verse that is frequently misunderstood by well-meaning Christians. That verse is none other than Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens, him, who strengthens me. I'm sure you've seen that on your mug every morning. In, pre in preparation for this, I wanted to refresh myself on how this verse is understood most widely. So I did what any great researcher does, and I typed in, I can do all things into YouTube, and waited to see what came up first. I discovered that an amazing basketball player, um, one I've, I've watched and thought, wow, this guy's amazing. Um, one of the best in the world and possibly a contender for an all-time great. Stephen Curry just so happens to be a professing Christian. To his credit, he wears his faith in his sleeve and he may well be the real deal. But that doesn't mean that he's immune to misinterpreting scripture. Listen to this quote by him, speaking about his shoes. It represents a Bible verse I wear on my shoes, Philippians 4 verse 13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's also my mantra, how, can, how I get up for games and why I play the way I do. There's another example that I found. And that's the, the famous American football player. His name is Tim Tebow, who just so happens to look like a male model. 
is passionate about celibacy before marriage, which is a good thing, and is married to an ex-Miss Universe, who just so happens to be South African. I think her name's Demi Lee, Demi Lee something, I can't remember her name. Anyway, she was on the front page of U Magazine, and the whole thing was like, these two people um, haven't slept together before marriage. This guy is the evangelical darling in the USA. And he wears this verse, Philippians 4 verse 13, on his elbow. He used to have it as war paint, war paint under his eyes. Once again, he also seems to be a sincere guy, and he most likely wants to give God the credit for all that he has achieved. The idea, though, that you get from these two guys is that this verse is saying, if you have the dream to be successful like me, to overcome the odds like I have done, you can. In God's strength, you can do anything you want to do. Is this the correct understanding of the verse? Should we passionately defend this understanding of the passage? Because these guys, who are some of the most famous Christians in the world, again reiterating that they seem to be the real deal from what I've read. Should their interpretation of the verse hold? Or at least what the, the interpretation that's implied from everything they say. What if you have no musical talent, but want to be the next big thing in music, and everybody's telling you, my friend, you can't sing. Will God give you that dream if you just trust in him enough? What if you are at best a C student and you can't do maths, but you want to be, or let's say physics or chemistry, but you want to be a nuclear physicist? Will God make you overcome the odds despite everyone telling you that as hard as you work, the best you get is a C, my friend. Don't try and be a nuclear physicist. Well, if you believe this text in the interpretation, in the light of the way so many other people quote it in everyday life, the short answer to all these questions is no. You have misunderstood the text. And that doesn't mean that God's word has proven to be untrue. The problem is you've misunderstood it. And it appears as though these guys have misunderstood it as well. Let's see what Paul actually meant as we study Philippians 4, verse 10 to 13, the verse in its historical context, beginning with our first heading, which is context, context, context. You know, they say when real estate... The rule is location, location, location. Well, when you're studying your Bible, context, context, context. If you listened to these guys and the way this verse is most widely used, you'd think that Paul wrote this at a point in his life when he was on top of the world, when a Christian megastar with five million subscribers on YouTube. But you know what? You'd be wrong. Let's just say that Paul's circumstances were far less than ideal. He wrote this letter while sitting in prison. You can see that in chapter 1, verse 7 of the book of Philippians. What we have in verse 10 is a needy Paul. He's a needy man sitting in prison. And just for your information, back in those days, it was your family's responsibility to look after you if you landed up in prison, meaning the government did nothing to care for you. So if you were cold or hungry, you had to rely on your loved ones to provide for your needs. Here we see Paul rejoicing in verse 10 to 12 that Epaphroditus brought a gift from the church in Philippi. You can read about that in Chapters 2, verse 25 to 30. And before I move on, remember that Paul wasn't exactly popular in prison either. 
In chapter 1, verse 15 to 17 of Philippians, we see that some of the men were preaching the gospel for one purpose only, so that Paul would be punished more harshly. What we need to wrap our heads around here is that Paul was suffering. Paul was unsuccessful in a worldly sense. Paul wasn't speaking as the basketball star or the American football star to motivate everyone. He was speaking as someone who was unsuccessful in a worldly sense. Quick food for thought. Who do you allow to shape your mind, your morals, and your beliefs? Do you allow social media influencers because they are entertaining and have cool friends? And if you think I'm being mad, Joe Biden's the president of America because of social media influences. Do you allow celebrities, people that make lots of money because they sing well or are good at pretending to be somebody else, do you rely on them? Are they your source? Are they your authority? What about beautiful people? Do you meet someone and say, sure, this is a beautiful person. Everything that comes out of their mouth must be true. What about politicians? Should we trust politicians and lawyers? Because they have great power and a lot of influence. People that speak well, good speakers can often convince you of lies without you even realizing it. Or who shapes your mind? What about the person who you deem to be the smartest person in the room? Who is smart enough to defend any position, whether right or wrong? But I mean, if your assumption is that the more educated one is, the more moral they're going to be, you'll assume that the smartest person in the room would never be out to deceive you. Have you ever asked the question who or what is your highest authority as Christians we say it is God as he speaks to us in the scriptures and we are unashamed of that let's now look at the whole of verse 10 under the heading grateful Paul for people more than stuff what we have in verse 10 is Paul giving thanks to the Lord for the love of the Philippians. As I mentioned, Epaphroditus brought this gift for Paul from the church in Philippi to sustain him while he was in prison. Now, Paul was grateful for what he was given. Some people, as they read this, they think, oh, it sounds like Paul's a little ungrateful. But Paul wasn't ungrateful. He was just saying, I'm so grateful for what you've given me, but I'm far more grateful that my brothers and sisters in Christ still love me and still care for me. It seems, according to verse 10, that Paul may have entertained thoughts of the Philippian church having abandoned their concern for him. Why, why would this happen? You may wonder why he doubt their love for him, even for a second. But let me tell you, church leaders are no strangers to people they love and trust, letting them down. And Paul was no exception. Paul knew this, feeling well of being disappointed. Just listen to 2 Timothy 4 verse 10 where it says, Demas, a close friend of Paul, he even mentions him in some of the letters. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. This is why Paul was most grateful for the, the, the Philippian church's concern for him, even more than the stuff they gave him. It's also worth considering how one of Paul's greatest trials was his constant worry about the well-being of God's people. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 27 to 28, where Paul speaks of all of the trials that he experienced over his ministry. I'm going to read this for you, 27 to 28 
of verse 27 to 28 of 2 Corinthians 11. In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Sounds like where he is now. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? Paul's love for the church must have overflowed when he realized that Epaphroditus almost lost his life in his efforts to get to Paul. With Epaphroditus' life-threatening illness hindering him from getting to Paul sooner. Paul must have been expecting this package. And then it didn't pitch, and he said, oh, another Demas. Another situation like that. Meanwhile, the guy was sick. He was almost dying. But he wasn't going to stop. He was going to do everything in his power to get to Paul. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be very careful about how you perceive the behavior of your fellow Christians. Often we assume the worst when dealing with our family in Christ. We assume that the reason that the pastor hasn't visited is because he doesn't care, as opposed to being overly busy. We often assume that sometimes someone isn't at church because they're backsliding as opposed to being violently ill. And maybe that applies to where we stand on this, this pandemic. Some people being more cautious and some less cautious. And we're assuming, no, there's a hard problem that side. Oh, no, there's a hard problem that side. Maybe there is a different in our, difference in ideology. But that doesn't mean that somebody's just abandoned the faith. Maybe you should go speak to them first. Alex's good friend, uh, a good friend of hers, has this brilliant saying. I'm not going to quote any great theologians to you yet. But it's a brilliant little quote about how we should react to our brothers and sisters in Christ when things like this happen. It's offense is taken, not given. So don't take it. Often when we take a closer look at a situation that has led to us being offended, we'll find that our offense is unjustified. Don't automatically assume the worst of your brothers and sisters in Christ. This brings us to verses 11 to 12 under the heading, Paul's contentment when lacking and prospering. And this is in verses 11 and 12, as I said. What we see in these verses is Paul saying that even though he was very grateful for the gift that the Philippian church had sent him, he didn't need it. He most likely mentioned this not because he wanted to be offensive to them, but instead because he didn't want them as a church to feel bad that their aid to him, him had been delayed. He didn't want them to worry that if they couldn't assist him, that he had no hope. He didn't want them to think, Th that's it, if you guys don't get to him, he's dead. This probably arose because, as I said, Epaphroditus almost lost his life trying to get this gift to Paul. And he's saying in a, a roundabout kind of way, you guys don't have to risk your lives to get to me. Next time you send me a gift and Epaphroditus gets sick along the way, bring him home immediately. Don't let him almost die in a place where he doesn't have any family. God was looking after Paul and had taught him to be content in all the different circumstances of life, even if that meant being hungry for a little bit longer. Because Paul knew God would provide another source of food if he needed it. In chapter 2, verse 28, you get the impression Paul is saying, let's just get this amazing guy back to you before he dies trying to serve me. You see a similar attitude in Paul in the book of Philemon, 
where he says, no, just get this guy away from me. He served me so well, but I need to get him home. He needs to sort out business there with you guys. Can you see why this Philippian church brought Paul so much joy? Wouldn't that bring you joy? Someone who loves you so much, they're willing to risk their life. What's interesting in verse 12 is Paul saying that he had learned contentment, facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Have you ever asked the question at this point? Why does Paul speak about needing to be content while prospering? Surely he just needed to say that I've learned to be content when I have nothing. Colin actually mentioned this to me. Well, this reveals something about our sinful proclivity. When we have nothing, we battle to find contentment. And when we have everything, we still battle to find contentment. As I mentioned when preaching through Joel, some of the most miserable people in the world are those that have it all. I can personally testify to how when I had less, I was happy with that. But now that I have more, the idea of losing some of the things that I'd learned to live without for years, that terrifies me. This may seem like a silly example, but it illustrates my point well. So take it as that. For 32 years, I had no aircon in my car. And you know what? I was happy. But for the last seven years, I've had it. And you know what? The idea of having a car with no air con terrifies me, especially on days like this. There's a softness that comes over us when we prosper. A lack of contentment can weasel its way into your heart very quickly. And we all have to be careful of being owned by our stuff as opposed to owning it. But how do you achieve this contentment? Because it's extremely difficult. Whether you are battling to make ends meet or sitting with millions in the bank. The answer to that question comes in verse 13. Possibly the most twisted text in all of scripture. Under the heading, what it really means. Finding this kind of contentment is impossible in our own strength. But according to verse 13, I can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what the verse actually means. We can now, no doubt, do whatever God empowers us to do, but that doesn't mean that we can do everything we put our mind to, just because we are Christians. You may want to fly by flapping your arms, but you won't achieve that just because you want to. Or believe that you can what, do whatever you put your mind to. This idea that we can achieve all of our dreams, even, even in God's strength, isn't biblical. It comes from the self-esteem and positive confession movement. It has more to do with the word faith movement than actually biblical Christianity. This unbiblical way of understanding this passage has permeated the church and causes people to doubt God's word because they, they, they buy it. And then they go to their trial at idols and they sing badly and they say, you're never going to become a singer. And then 10 years down the line they say, you know what, I trusted in God for my talent, but he didn't, he didn't give me what I wanted. The Bible's wrong. And that's why this is a serious error. I remember when Barry asked the children at the holiday club a few years back what they'd learned during the week. And that week, we had preached the gospel. We preached the gospel for four days. And one little girl, a well-meaning little girl, very cute, she said, 
What she'd learned in the week was we should always follow our dreams. Barry quickly and lovingly corrected her. He was very sensitive. Please know that. But where, where did this come from? We hadn't said that all week. Where did this idea come into her head? Probably her parents. It came from the kind of Christianity that uses the Bible for inspirational verses on mugs or bookmarks, as opposed to Christianity that takes Bible study seriously, in context and with all of Scripture in mind. A Christianity that emphasizes putting God's Word into practice, and not just letting it motivate us and teach us how to do things better. The kind of Christianity that emphasizes how we can't live a life that pleases God unless He saves us and empowers us to, as opposed to just pushing traditional or conservative morals. That's true Christianity. It's Christianity with some depth. It's not just a bookmark. It's not just a mug that you got at Kum Books. The point of Philippians 4 verse 13 is that we can have the same kind of contentment Paul had if God empowers us to. We can be happy with what we have right now if God simply does a miraculous work in our hearts. Let me conclude with a question. Who does this promise apply to? It doesn't apply to everybody. Who can tap into the strength that Paul experienced? The only people that can do all things through Christ who strengthens them are those who are in Christ and those who have Christ living in them. Let me repeat that. It's only those who are in Christ and those who have Christ living in them through the person of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is described most commonly in the New Testament as being in Christ. And in Colossians 1 verse 10, 27, we see that when we are saved, we have Christ in us. It's amazing. It's a mystery. It boggles our mind. So this may be hard to grasp, but when we are in Christ and He is dwelling within us, God will teach us the same contentment that Paul had. Listen to how Paul uses both of these concepts in Colossians 1 verse 27 to 28. To them, speaking of Christians, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And listen to how Paul describes what it means to be a Christian in Colossians 1, verse 21 to 23. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, you were once that, does this still describe you? Then you are not a Christian yet. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ today for the salvation of your soul. Let me carry on. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, describing Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, the goal of the atonement, which will never fail. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, showing that God empowers those he saves to live hopeful and holy lives, whatever their circumstances may be. Which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. We all battle with a lack of contentment, all of us. Even Paul as amazing as he was, had to learn contentment. Look at the text. It's there. He had to learn contentment. 
But for those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, God has not only saved us from hell, but also from that sinful lack of contentment which makes us slaves to our circumstances. Wherever you find yourself today, whether that be lacking or whether that be prospering, you can be content in God's strength. That's what Philippians 4 verse 13 actually means. Let's pray. Lord, as we read about Paul learning contentment because of his relationship with you, because you dwelt within him and he was in you, Lord, we pray that we would share that same privilege, that, Lord, wherever we find ourselves, whether that is prospering or lacking, and, Lord, we would we would find our contentment in you and in you alone. We know, Lord, that in many ways this is a process. We pray, Lord, that you may faithfully work that process in our life. And, Lord, we, we pray for those who don't know you because they have no hope. They have no hope of glory. They have no hope to overcome this, this tendency within ourselves to, to find, to, to be discontent no matter what our circumstances may be. We pray for those people. We pray that you would save them and begin that process in them and sanctify them and make them holy. We pray that for each one of us. Please be gracious, Lord. Amen.